July Ministries Sunday evening service. It's a blessing to be here. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. How many mothers do we have here? Mothers. We would not be here if it weren't for our mothers. <laughs> Literally. But in many other respects too, so we pay our respects. I, I send my greetings back to my mother in the US. Uh, it's not quite Mother's Day there yet. And it will be, so I'll um, contact her when she's, when I get home, I'll be able, I think I'm going to give her a call, say Happy Mother's Day to her. So we love our mothers and we're glad that the Lord has blessed us and uh, it's good to be here tonight. We have Yamel with us, just from Mexico. And we also have almost the whole Johnny family in the back. This is Eliza's mother, father. visiting tonight. They're always welcome. And uh, we're talking about Mexico and Eliza's work and how proud we are of Eliza and what she's accomplished there. But all the good reports and how the people want Eliza to go back and they're not asking. And I said, let Eliza rest for a little while. So it's nice for her to be here for a little while and do whatever the Lord calls her. Well, of course, we're going to stand behind her just like we always have. And let's just take this time to invite the Lord into this place. We're going to have a time of praise and worship. Why don't you stand to your feet with me as we pray. Father, we ask that you would be here with us tonight in spirit. That the power of the Holy Spirit would be upon us. Paul said of the churches, his prayer was that the fellowship of the Spirit be upon them. And that is what I pray, what I want. Not just a single touch, not just one little visit, but the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. A constant flow of your anointing. Lord, we welcome you. We gather into this place so that we can meet with you, that we can talk to you, that we can hear your voice, that you can have access to your people to do whatever you want to do in each and every one. Bring healing, bring direction, Lord God, bring, bring love, bring a warmth, bring peace and direction in the midst of confusion. Lord, bring healing to every realm, our mind, our emotions. Lord, let our wills be in your hands always. We give this time to you tonight, Lord. We give this place to you. Let this place be filled with the glory of God. Lord, let everything that we do tonight be to please you, to lift you up, and to glorify you. Have your way in this room tonight. We're not going to stop you or, or put an obstacle in your way. We're not going to say no. We're going to say, Lord, do whatever you want to do in us. Let your power flow through each and every person tonight. We invite you and we welcome you in Jesus' name. Let's give a hand clap of praise to the Lord.
appreciate, appreciate the presence of the Lord. Just with your eyes closed, close everything else out. Just pretend like there's no one else in the room but you and Jesus. Just you and the Lord. And that it's a private meeting, that he's coming here just for you, knowing exactly what you need. That it's an appointment that he's made to come and to dwell with you and to fix what ails you, to heal your disease. That he has come to meet you personally. And you say, but there's so many people in the room. Look, forget about everything that is distracting you. Leave your worries outside the door. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your future. Don't worry about your past. Focus on this moment right now in the presence of the Lord and look into the beautiful eyes of our King and know that He has no desire to hurt you, no desire to abandon you. He only wants to draw close to you and meet every single one of your needs. He loves you. Exactly like you are. You may say, but I have sin in my life. He does not run away from sin. He runs to the sin. He said, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners. He's looking for people who have problems so that he can prove himself wonderful and solve every one of them. Oh, Pastor, you don't know I have problems that probably have no solution. No, no, no. I defy you to offer a problem to Jesus that he can't figure out, that he can't solve. I'm telling you, if we trust in the creator of the universe, there is no knot in our lives tied so tight that God cannot untie it. There's no limit to his power. We are his children, and he loves us as such. And if we, as earthly fathers, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our heavenly Father know how to give us the Holy Spirit? His presence upon your name. Jesus. Step into the wall. 
thank you for your wonderful presence in this room tonight. Thank you that as we gather two or more in your name, you keep your promise and you are right here in the midst of us. They're not just words on a page, but everything you wrote has meaning. Everything you wrote is true. You said you would be with us always, that you would never leave us, you would never forsake us. You said that if we gather together in your name, you would come, and so you are here. And the second part of that same promise was whatever we agree upon, you would do it. Lord, there are people in this room tonight that have needs. And we agree that you are the miracle worker. You are the one that can do the impossible. Right here, from within the reach of the Spirit, right inside the cloud of God, because I'm telling you, God is here with us. You can reach out and receive something wonderful from Him. Every person in the Bible who received a miracle, they did it according to their faith. They did it according to what they were looking for. They reached out, the woman with the issue of blood, reached out and grabbed the hem, the garment of Jesus. Zacchaeus climbed the tree. They all did something, some act of faith. Don't be afraid and say, well, I don't want to be too emotional. Well, how about the blind Bartimaeus, how emotional he was. He cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. How emotional was it? so they can lower their paralytic friend in front of Jesus. How emotional was King David when he left about before the ark in praise of a mighty God? He's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He's looking for those who are not ashamed to express their love to him. Express their church and and so they they praise the Lord for a while before we get there and they're so good at it now that 
By the time I get there, I have such little work to do because they're so deep in the presence of the Lord. God's power comes on them and makes my job so much easier now that they've developed this really close relationship with the Spirit of God. And uh, they are like his little children. So we, there was an abundance of joy in the room. And uh, I did a couple of songs only. And, and the Holy Spirit just come and touched all the people. And I had the longest time trying to say anything. So finally, uh, we, we, when the Spirit stopped really touching the people, then Eliza came, she shared her testimony, her story, to encourage the people. Yeah, now come and greeted the people also. It was a real blessing to have her there. And uh, that church in Gaylon, the, the blind ministry, actually, they, they support our missionaries. Uh, we took up the offerings from there. All the offerings that come into us, we end up giving back out to, to the missionaries. And uh, um, very little of what we take in doesn't go to some missionary somewhere. We just want to do that. We believe. Believe in the, in the... You can't hear My wife is giving me the signal that she can't hear me. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. The title of the message tonight is We Are God's Children of Purpose. Um, we're not big on ceremony, so um, we're not having a Mother's Day pageant, but <laughs> at the end of the service, we will pray. In fact, some people go, they find other churches on Sunday morning so they can get to more of the religious atmosphere and go through all the things. We're, we're more nitty gritty, down to earth in this church. We go straight for the jugular vein. We go straight to the word. We go straight to the presence of the Lord. And uh, we don't want to hang around on the outskirts of the camp. We want to go deep in. I'm not interested in the outer court. I think it's lovely. And I think the brazen laven is fabulous. And the altar is great. But I'm interested in what's inside the tabernacle. Into the tent of meeting. And the showbread is wonderful. And I think the candlestick is fantastic. And that's the most interesting incense burner I've ever seen in front of that curtain. But what really interests me is what's on the other side of that curtain. And because that curtain has been ripped in half for me by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to have that go to waste. Provision is made for us to go right into the Holy of Holies. And that's where he wants. See, that's where the Father is waiting. The Father sitting there above the mercy seat. And that's symbolic, of course, we can look through the scriptures about the tabernacle and know that that's the inner sanctum of God, the presence of the Lord. We're the temple of the Lord. And our recognition of what he's done and what he is, we can go into the deepest presence of the Lord. And, and we are God's children of purpose. And I, I was reading Romans chapter 8. Actually, I, I began by uh, going after the concept of conquering in the Bible, the word conquer. And uh, the way I develop messages is basically I listen to the Holy Spirit and I start to pursue themes. And very often, I will find something I was not looking for. How many of you have ever done that in the Bible? That you, have, you decide you're going to study something, but when you get in there, you find something much better in there. And you think, well, you know, I had a good idea, but this idea is much better. So uh, that's usually how it happens. So I want us to go into this message. And as we do, we begin reading in Romans chapter 8. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now that's, that's a pretty hefty statement. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's presence on earth, he himself, and, and I like the way it says that, that Paul wants us to know as he's writing the Romans, that the Spirit himself, not some agent other than the Holy Spirit in God's power, not a preacher, not a teacher, but the Holy Spirit himself has an important message that he is speaking directly, not to our soul, not to our mind, but to our spirit. So as deep calls to deep, there's a conversation going on between spirit and spirit, God's spirit, our spirit, and he wants us to know that we are God's children. Did you know that you are God's child? Not just, not just a slave, not just a servant. We are servants. We are slaves, but we are more servants than slaves to other men. We serve people. That's really what the word minister means. The very word minister means like a waiter at a table. So we wait on people to help them, to serve them. At least that's what we're supposed to be doing if we are operating as 
agents of God. But in our relationship directly with God, the Father, He is our Father. We are His children, and He cares about us, and He loves us. The Holy Spirit is speaking to and with our spirit at all times. And according to these verses, He wants us to understand that we are God's children. Everyone that accepts Jesus as Savior of his soul is given a place in the family of God. As the scripture in John chapter 1 verse 10 says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him, yet to all who received Him. How many of you have received Jesus? You remember a time in your life that you made a decision, because it has to be a moment that you remember. You don't get saved by osmosis. You understand? I like quoting R.W. Shambach. Just because a cat had kittens in an oven, it doesn't make them biscuits. <laughs> you get saved by a choice. You cross a line, you choose, and all of us should remember when we received him. And to as many as do that, all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. We are part of the family of God. We are united together in a family, in the body of Christ. We have many brothers. Jesus is referred to as our elder brother, as an example for us, the firstborn among many brothers, it calls him. Let's look at what it continues to say here in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, and you are, I think you are, because you just said you are. If you said you received Jesus, you've been given the right to be a child of God. So now you are the sons and daughters. And if we are children, then we are heirs. Everybody say, yay. Yay. You're an heir. Well, wouldn't it be great if you got a phone call all of a sudden and you know you don't know this, but over in Beijing, an old auntie that, that was distantly related to you, she had no one but her factories and her millions of dollars, and she's passed on. Come to find out, she's made you the heir of everything she left behind. How many of you would be upset if you heard that kind of thing? <laughs> no, you would rejoice. And when we get the understanding that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, then we understand that we are given and being offered riches that go way beyond any earthly dimension. None of the wealth of this world. Our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the Bible says. There's no limit to it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything out there belongs to God. And if you understand that he is your father and you are his child, it sets you up as an heir of unlimited blessings. You have the richest daddy that has ever been in all time. Can you think of anyone richer than God? I've heard men joke around and say, that man is richer than God. But it's just a joke because they know there's no way any human being could be richer than God. If you have a rich father in the natural, have you ever, did you grow up maybe with children who were peers with you, but their parents were very wealthy, and they always had the nicest things, and there was no limit. I had some friends, I was very poor when I was growing up, but I had some friends who had wealthy parents, and they had anything they wanted. It, the newest shoe was always on their foot. The newest bicycle was always under them. They always had the freshest, newest, the newest albums. They had all the albums. That dates me, doesn't it? When we still call them albums. Now you call them CDs. And I remember eight-track tapes. How many of you remember eight-track tapes? By a show of hands, not to embarrass you, but just to alienate us from all the young people. <laughs> the young people looking at me like, what's an eight-track tape? It was tapes, literally. We had music tapes that were like, they looked like big coffins. I mean, you needed to cram the, <laughs> stick it in the machine and push the button. And the tape was that fat. And before that, there was reel to reel. My father had a tech reel to reel in the house with Rolling Stone stuff on. We used to play old music. Gosh. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God. That's great news, but. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Okay, we have a rich father, but there's a deal that we have to understand. You want the goods, you want the blessings, but nothing's free. Did you ever hear anybody tell you there's nothing free in this life? And I'm, I'm afraid to break the news to you that it works the same way with God. 
that God will give you freely salvation, but he needs you to give him something. Some people ask, you know, what does it cost you to have the presence of God and the glory of God? Well, it costs you everything. It costs, if you save your life, you lose your life. If you lose your life, you save it in him. So there's an exchange he's looking to make, and that's why he says, yes, we are heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we have an inheritance dependent upon our cooperation with the sharing of suffering that we must endure for the sake of Jesus and our association with him. You should say no suffering, equals no glory. You want the glory of God, you want the provision of the Lord, well, there also has to come with it suffering. And I know, I mean, I, I know you always hear me talking about that, but because it's not me always mentioning it, it's the Bible. Every verse we uncover, is it not true that team keeps coming back to haunt us? That there's a price to pay and there's something that's going to have to be done. So no suffering, no glory. That's okay, let's go on and look what it continues to say. The creation... It says in verse, yeah, that's good. Romans, verse 18, Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings. Now he's talking about, yeah, you're going to be an heir to receive it. You have to have sufferings. But let's just think for a moment about these sufferings contrasted with what that, that inheritance is. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, it says. And I think about what it says there, that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The world was created for us and is waiting on us to be complete so that it can enjoy its fullest purpose. And a real revelation I got when I was looking at this was, you know, you were not created to serve the earth. It was created to follow you and to serve you and come after you. So this is what God has done. Now the creation, that means, is subject to decay, meaning that things rot. Wood rots, the, the steel will, will uh, rust, all these problems occur. We have these things in seeing creation that surrounds us, but it will not forever. There's coming a time when even creation itself will be eternal. And that it is waiting for us. It cannot do it without us. It's waiting for us to become what we need to become. And all of this is aimed at fulfilling the plans of God that we be with him as his children forever. Remember the whole title of this message is we are God's children and, and he wants us with him. This is the revelation that we all must have to experience and enjoy life in abundance here on earth and then into eternity. It continues in verse 23. And I'm, I'm going through this. Go to the next uh, verse 23. It says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So this inheritance that he's speaking of, that we're going to receive the blessings that God is giving us, they're coming to us, but we have to understand that through the suffering, through enduring the persecution that we get from identifying with him, we also will be blessed. The whole creation is waiting. We have these groanings inwardly waiting. And this is the work between the Spirit. Remember this started out saying that the Spirit is speaking to our spirit. As we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the communication is continued. You are not yet made perfect. You are justified in your current state of weakness and failures and called right in spite of yourself when you trust Jesus. In other words, just as the creation decays, we decay. Anybody who is older, as you get older, you know you're decaying. I see decay every morning I look in the mirror. I see a new decay line. <laughs> A new mark, and, and I'm still young, you know, I just made 45, so I'm, st I'm still a child. 
but still I can see and feel and the certain sounds my bones make they didn't make when I was younger and certain cracks and pops when I get out of bed in the morning and it says time some of you are older than me so you know does it keep getting worse it gets worse oh don't tell me that no there has to be a limit. Snaps and crocks and, and little crickles and, and sounds. But we're getting older. We're decaying. But it's okay because we're going to be glorified. And while we're here on earth, the Lord wants us to identify with the eternal plan. And all this is going somewhere. Just relax. You're not yet made perfect, but you're justified. In other words, you can't. We groan and feel frustration inside because we feel and know that we will eventually be made perfect. In your heart, is it not true as a believer? Every morning you wake up and pray, you want to be very good. You want to be perfect. You, when you're in the presence of the Lord praying, you want, you want to be the best. You want to be identical to Jesus. But how, how does that work out for you by the end of the day? Not too well, does it? Why? Because we are corrupt. Even bought with the Jesus, even, even washed with the blood of the Lamb, we still are in that state. And so we groan. There's a groaning. And sometimes Paul really described the groaning well when he talked about his self-loathing, when he called himself, oh, wretched man, that I am. The battle, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. That constant battle that he had. Verse 26 continues. It says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. So yes, we're weak, but we have a friend. We have help. We do not know what we ought to pray far, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. I mean, I've actually heard people say, well, you know, this groaning cannot be uttered. That's, you know, tongues. No, how can it be tongues? Tongues are an utterance. You utter tongues. This is talking about something you can't speak. If you've ever been in the mighty presence of God, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you know exactly what this is talking about. From deep inside of you, in the center of you, a twisting and a movement and a groan. It actually manifests as a groan at times. I've heard many people in services where the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them and they go, Oh, you can hear that. Like it's almost like they're giving birth to a child. And it's interesting, in a moment, it's going to compare it to that very, that very truth. But we know that we ought to. We don't know what we have to pray. We don't know how to fix ourselves. But you know what? The Spirit Himself. Once again, the Spirit Himself. I'm not, as a pastor, I can't come stand by your side. It's going to be okay. I can't every day walk you by the hand and say, come on, let's do good today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to be holy today. Righteous, righteous, righteous. <laughs> I can't stay with you all the time. But you have a counselor. You have the comforter. The parakletos, meaning in the Greek, the one called alongside. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Now here's a big key. Remember that there's an inheritance, but the inheritance does not come to us because we simply name the name of Jesus. Inheritance comes to the obedient to the Father. How many times have you seen wealthy children disowned by their parents and written out of wills? I mean, have you ever seen that before? The child goes out, does something ridiculous. If not totally written out of the will, at least the will is amended to give them a much smaller portion. Not equal portions. And so this is the same thing. Sometimes that we do, if we do the wrong things, we're not conforming because even the Spirit Himself, He's going to be hard at work in you, but for what purpose? To accordance or in accordance with God's will, not your will. This is why Jesus spoke so much about the Spirit while on earth. He wanted us to understand that we cannot make it without the Comforter at our side at all times. We must continuously depend upon His knowledge and help. He is the helper. Now, our frailty and inability has rendered us useless on our own. So if you're by yourself trying to do things, if you are self-made man, congratulations. But even a self-made man was made by God. Because God gave you the ability to make yourself something. And so it would be better that you give all the glory to God. This is the state of sinful man. 
None is righteous, the Bible says. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He canceled the debt of the sinful condition and its ramifications in time and eternity by cleansing us with his blood. Now, I'm sorry if I'm getting pretty deep here tonight, but the Lord said I needed to teach you. So welcome to the class. We're going to go into some principles, and I'm going to break some things down to you out of this passage. And if you pay attention, you're probably going to understand the 8th chapter of Romans in a whole new way. It says, we do not know what to do or how to do it because of the weak state of our being. So our helplessness renders us unable, or our frailty and inability has rendered us useless on our own. We are useless without the help of the Spirit. We desperately need the Spirit of God all the time. From the moment I wake up, the first thing I do is cry out for the help of the Spirit. I don't want to get out of my bed without the Holy Spirit's help. I want the Holy Spirit to be there when I do hear those new cracks and snaps. To say, it's okay, it's okay, I'm with you. I want the Holy Spirit to be with me every step of the way. Let's continue verse 28. Very popular Oh. I skipped one on you. The problem is that, yeah, the problem is that we're hoping for the completion, so to the completion of the process that will not occur until we are resurrected. And here's the thing. If you think you're going to be perfect now, I hate to break the news to you, it's not going to happen. You're never going to be perfect. You can try your best, but you're never going to attain perfection. While still in this earthly state of weakness and inability, we should not trust our own thoughts and ideas. You need to let the Lord leave. We cannot trust ourselves. The Spirit is our only hope to make it through this life. And this is why Jesus put so much emphasis on the Holy Spirit coming and habitation with his 14, 15, and 16. All three chapters of the book of John are dedicated to him telling the disciples, the Holy Spirit's coming, you need the Holy Spirit. The last thing he did as he was leaving earth, okay, I'm going, I'm going, oh, oh, one more thing. Go and wait for the promise of the Father. Don't, don't, it's like that old American Express commercial, don't leave home without it. So he was telling them, don't do, don't move without the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus knew that it was the answer for what we were looking for. His presence always with us. Verse 28 is the famous verse. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now we love this, but we really just look at the first part. We know all things work out for us. Everything is going to work out. And everything will work out in life if we simply do what it says. Love him and respond to the call. Those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So we love the Lord, but he's calling us to his purpose. All things work together according to his purpose. We just saw according to his will. We just saw. Now we see according to his purpose. His will. His purpose, now he's about to get deeper, the writer here, Paul does, as he goes in and says in verse 29, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is far as who can be against us, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So let's break down the verse so we can better grasp what the Lord has done for us. And I call this five steps of God's unfolding love. Now, everything we've covered so far, because I wanted to go through those verses, is just building up to what I'm about to show you. We know there's an inheritance. We know there's a plan. There's a purpose. There's a will. And God has arranged it that all of creation, you understand, all of the natural universe, every microbe, every germ, every bacterium, every bird, every leaf, every speck of sand, everything is an employee for God for your benefit. And if you look at carefully what it's saying, yes, creation groans for us, waiting for us. That means God, when we say somebody has to turn heaven and earth upside down, God does that. He will turn things. I've seen him shut down nations for his children. 
Some of you have heard me tell the story about uh, Ruth Ann and Victor Martinez. That's what Eliza went to visit in Nicaragua. She went to visit the daughter of Ruth Ann and Victor. They were buying a building and they had a limited amount of money in Mexico. This is back in the 1990s. And I was there with them when they did this and they went to the exchange, money exchange office. And the amount of money they had, now they had to put a down payment on a theater. Be like, you buy a theater with like 800 seats in it, a big building. And when they bought these things, they were costing there in Mexico uh, maybe half a million dollars or, or a third of a million dollars. And it's cheaper in that economy because it's Mexico than it is here in Singapore. But these, are, these were big theaters. They were buying theaters and converting them into churches. And I was working for them at that time. In fact, I pastored a theater. My church, I was a pastor of a movie theater. And we didn't do movies anymore. It formerly was a movie theater, but when I did it, it was just, we got in there, we painted it, we set it up. Uh, I got a keyboard, I led worship, and I pastored. And it's so funny, because we planted the church, and it was sometimes a little embarrassing, because, you know, when we, you start out a church, you only have a handful of people. And so I'd have like 15 people with 800 chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and we even had a balcony. <laughs> And I would look up at the balcony and all the empty chairs and preach the word of God to the balcony. Hallelujah. But when we were buying these, they went to go buy them. They had a down payment. They were on their way to the real estate office to buy something, to make the down payment. But they were missing somewhere around $20,000. I mean, the, the way that it was, there was this huge gap. They did not have enough money. And the deal was made, and they were on their way to give the cash. They had a bag of cash, literally, a brown paper bag full of cash to pay to the real estate people. But they were missing about $25,000, a lot of money. They were making a big down payment, but there was a big chunk missing. And they were on their way, and I knew how much was in the bag and how much was needed, and I even asked the stupid question. Look, when you have people living in faith, don't ask them questions. But I said, if it costs this much for the down payment, and you only have this much, and we're going there right now, where are you going to get the $25,000? And they were like, well, the Lord will provide, and I just believe the Lord that God will. I'm thinking these people are nuts. <laughs> Well, is somebody going to knock on the window of the car and hand them money or something? And I thought, certainly they're going to stop by some bank or something. But no. They said, we just have to trust the Lord. And I said, okay, what do we need? I was driving, too. And at the time, I used to drive their van. And I said, uh, I said well, what do we do? Well, we, they said, a lot of this cash that we have is American dollars. So we need to take it and exchange it. And even with the exchange rate, they had figured out the amount, so they were still missing 25000 but they had that last stop. Now, when they pulled up into the car park of the exchange, the money exchange facility, at that very moment, a strange thing happened in the monetary system of the entire nation, 100 million people. The, something happened with the economy. They have the bolsa, they call it, which is like our, our stock exchange. Something happened, you know, it's a very volatile market. Financial markets can just go crazy. Something happened that caused it to go berserk. It was such a severe shock to the system, and this is documented, you actually go back and find it. It's such a severe shock that it caused the entire nation's phone system to freeze up. Nobody could even call each other. It locked up because panic, all the bankers, all the people panicked because the rate shot up. The rate of the value, the value of the Mexican peso decreased so dramatically, so quickly, that it threw shock through everyone. It only lasted for about five minutes. At the end of the five minutes, the rate returned to normal. Stay there for months and months on end. Just that little, little spike. And did you know that was exactly the moment that they carried their bag of cash to the exchange office? When they gave it there, which the office is required by law to give the current exchange as dictated, they gave the exchange, and do you know how much extra money it produced? $25,000. God, I saw it in my own eyes. See, this is when I was a young man serving in ministries. I served under seven major mentors, and they, that's where I learned faith. I saw miracles. I saw things happen that cannot happen. And I knew, well, if it can happen for them, it can happen for me. God's no respect of persons. 
<laughs> and there I myself have lived miracles with tens of thousands of dollars and, and just I've seen God do whatever has to be done. But I never forget that. And I saw that what it says in Romans that the earth, all things work together for the good of the ones. Why were they buying that building? They weren't buying it so they could create a huge summer home. They were buying it to have a church to reach the Mexican souls for Jesus. The purpose of God. The Great Commission. Now as we break this down in these verses that we just read, we're going to see five steps. This is His unfolding love for us. Foreknowledge is number one. God knew beforehand all that He will be. Now, a lot of people get confused. If you've ever had trouble wrestling with the ideas of Calvinism or predestination, I'm about to give you help out here. I don't believe in predestination as prescribed by other people, but I'll tell you exactly what it says here. For whom he did foreknow. The first step is his foreknowledge. God's love for us starts long before we ever existed. His love is an eternal love that birthed the desire in God to bless us and do what is best for us. This simply means that he had knowledge of the events of our life before time began. You know, the Bible says that he, that before the foundation of the world, he, he knew and he had a plan for you. And you think, well, how is that even possible? It's not possible for a, a linear, time-oriented being like us. But if you step out of time into eternity, and a day becomes a thousand years and a thousand years a day, and it can be expanded and contracted, and, and you can freeze time, speed it up, slow it down, you can do whatever you want, well then, that makes you God. So his knowledge goes beyond time. He sees everything before it happens. He has foreknowledge of things. Because he's all-knowing, all-wise, he knows all things. And the first step to his unfolding love is that it is his eternal knowledge and desire for us that existed long ago. His foreknowledge means he knew everything that was best for you. He knows the best. Before earth ever existed, he knew exactly what he wanted for you. That's good news. Jesus speaks of the will of the Father compared to the will of earthly fathers, saying that the Heavenly Father has plans to far exceed anything that earthly fathers can do to bless their children. I named some of the scriptures very quickly in Matthew 7 11. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? In Matthew 18, 40, in the same way, your, your Father in Heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. This is all showing you the foreknowledge, the desire of God. He has a desire for these things. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Him? It says good things in Matthew, or good gifts He will give to you if you ask Him, and also He'll give you the Holy Spirit. Luke twelve thirty two to thirty three. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. In other words, he's excited about giving it to you. The Father desires that you be blessed and do his will, but it does not stop at his desire. First comes desire. If you do anything for anybody, you first have to have a desire to do it. If I wanted to bless Carlos back there, it starts with a desire. Maybe we had a conversation. Maybe he told me something that endeared him to me or made me feel good about him, gave me pleasure for him. Well, then I, you know what? I want to do something special for Cosmos. God knew us before. He looked at our lives, even with our sin, and decided, you know what? I love them. Yeah, they make some mistakes. They make some errors, but I love them, and I just want to do something. I want to do something wonderful for them. That's God's purpose. God is not willing that, that any should perish, the Bible says. And that's the first one, foreknowledge. Step two is predestination. God predestined you and your life. Now, this is the word people get stuck on. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, this predestination is from the Greek word where we get the word horizon, horizo. When we say horizon, all horizon is is as far as you can see, it's the parameter. In other words, the, the parameter or the lines that mark out a place. Very simple word. It means limit or boundary. You have political lines 
here in your own nation, Simbawang. You can find a line where Simbawang goes over in, into what you call woodlands. You know, you can see the line between Bishan and Angmokyo. You know, you see there's political lines. You can stand on the street and find, if you know where it's at and you care, you can find that there are different regions. Same in my state, we have states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, and we often would go jump back and forth on the border when we were kids. We'd be traveling, we'd make our mom and dad stop the car. Didn't you do that? I mean, I'm looking at Sylvia laughing back there. We would stop and there'd be a sign with a line saying this is the... How many of you ever been on the bridge and the, on the causeway and there's that sign with the line between Malaysia? One time we were stuck in traffic and the people in the front seat were in Malaysia and the people in the back seat were in Singapore. <laughs> and I was sticking my head in Malaysia and then pulling it out. Sticking it there, pulling it out. I was crossing the border several times without a visa. All I wanted. <laughs> That's what this word means. It means the lines that were written. With the prefix for before in front of it, it simply means limited or outlined beforehand. That he set boundaries beforehand. In other words, God had a desire to bless you. That was number one we saw, foreknowledge, in the first step of this message. But now he goes another step and makes a strategy and an outline for your life and future before you are ever born. In other words, he made a blueprint of the life of Eliza. He made a blueprint of, of the life of Elaine, of Ben's life. And this blueprint is according to his will, his purpose, it's God's good idea about you. For knowledge, his desire, he longed, I want the best. I want the best for my children. What can I do to bless my children? I have a good idea, and me as daddies make plans on how to bless our children. No, Who, whoever is father. You know your fathers would do for that if, you, if you're not a father yet. Our father knows how to do it much better, and that's what Jesus kept on saying. If you know how to do it, how much more do you think my father will know? Your heavenly father will put your earthly father to shame. He is going to do things for you and is going to bless you in a way that no earth, and we as earthly fathers, we really try hard, but man, if we're in competition against Jehovah God, we're going to fail. But we still try to cooperate with him to be the best blessing that we can be. Predestination. This is what it means that he's predestined. He has a destiny for you that he has predetermined, outlined, drawn out on the paper of heaven. This is the book of your life produced according to his good pleasure to bless you. He loved you so much before the earth was ever made that he sat down and he wrote a book and wrote on the binding of the book, Carlos. He wrote on the binding of the book there the name. He has a book in heaven with Stephen written on It's written there, Stephen. And it's on the shelves in heaven. That's how I visualize it. He has a plan. There's a purpose. There's a strategy. It's the best possible idea for my life. Now here's where it gets a little hairy, so to speak. The book is there. And Jesus is the template or prototype for us to follow. As far as character, personality, all of those things... He is the embodiment of the ideal of God for man to fulfill his will. He was 100% man. He self-emptied himself of all his divinity, so he was a man. He was the perfect man. And he says, look, be like me. And that's a big set of shoes to fill. Because Jesus, I mean, come on, he's Jesus. But we need to do our best to try to do that. But the Father knew exactly what we are. Remember, we just started seeing all building up to these verses was in our weakness. He helps us. In our inability, the Spirit Himself. I'm trying to give you a deeper image of what the Holy Spirit's job is in your life every single moment of every day. Or as Eliza said, I love it. She said, 60 seconds a minute, God is with me. 60 seconds a minute. It really struck me. I started laughing when she said that because, yes, it's absolutely true. Every second, the Holy Spirit himself is working out a plan according to this book. He carries an extra copy of the book. There's a copy in heaven. Obviously, the Father has it, but the Holy Spirit, he downloaded it into his iPhone or something because he has it all the time comparing your steps with what's written there. He wants you to do his will. 
Now, now that this book has, uh, has long ago been written for you and you are aware of this fact, you still have a choice to follow that plan or do your own things. Remember what the Bible says about your plans. Psalms 33, 10, 11, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. They have purposes. They have plans. Plans, purposes. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. What plans are those? Those are the plans written in that book before the creation of the world. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Proverbs 69, in his heart, a man has these plans, or his, he, he plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. The Lord has a better idea, Proverbs 19, 20, and many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. These scriptures make a lot more sense when you look at it in the light of, of Romans chapter 8. Proverbs 21, 2. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Jeremiah 18, 12, one of our favorites. We will continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. And then it, this is really what I'm talking about. That's not one of our favorites. That's pretty depressing. <laughs> I don't even like that one. Scratch it. Oh, this is the one I like. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So this gives us all a glimpse into what's written in that book that he has for you. His predestination, his horizo, or the drawn lines before that he wrote for you are good things. Prosperity, blessings, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope, to give you a future. But it's at war with your ideas, many of the thoughts of man, the plans of man. And all these things are, are serving to confuse what God wants. That's why we need the Holy Spirit so desperately to give us the details of the book so that we don't try to implement our own things. Things do not work out for our own plans. They work out for His plans, it says in verse 28. Step number three. We're almost done. Calling. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, then He also called. Okay, what does this mean? He called. See, in the first two steps... Born from the purpose of God for our lives, we see the Lord's part being done. In other words, God already did what He had to do. God even did it as far as making it possible for you to have access to all these things by sending His Son Jesus to die on the cross for you. God's job is done. God is resting on His throne right now saying, okay, I'm done. He's wiped His hands and thought, okay, let's see what they do now. Holy Spirit, just, just go be with them. If they listen to you, just remind them of what's already done. Remind them that everything's already set up. In fact, we even have a house up here, uh, here for them. We have, we have homes ready for them, Jesus told us. Heaven has a place for us. He's done everything in His power for us to be blessed. And He has made all provision for that. Now, we have to cooperate with that plan and lay down our desires. He's calling. Why is He calling? Because He made the plan. He's written it. But now He's inviting us saying, come here. Come here, I have a good idea. I want to share with you the best idea you've ever seen for your life. And this is when he calls us. And the thing is, it makes it so hard about a calling from God is because it is radically different than anything you've dreamed up for yourself. As we've just seen established through Proverbs and Psalms, it says again and again, we have ideas, but they're nothing like his. And you know what's sad, and I almost want to cry thinking about it. Even I can teach the subject as deep as I want, as long as I want. But no matter what, ultimately, everybody's going to make a choice. And sadly, most are going to choose to do their own will. Most are going to decide, well, and they may justify these ideas, and they may have a different doctor than I do, and I welcome people to be free thinkers and to interpret the scriptures as they want. But to me, it's pretty clear. The calling of the Lord is when he reveals the plan to you, he will show you glimpses of the writings in the book in heaven. This is heavenly revelation. You know, the gifts of the Spirit operate on this concept. It is insight into the book in heaven for a person's life, revealed to another to help direct. This is how prophecy works. That's all the gift of the word of knowledge is. The gift of the word of wisdom is God showing you a little bitty glimpse. He's like copying a little bit and pasting it in your head for a moment so that you can read just that. He doesn't show you everything because then you'd be like this crazy psychic. <laughs> he just gives you a little bit to help people. 
Matthew 22, 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. That's why he's calling everybody, but not everyone will be chosen because not everyone chooses to do what he has planned from before the foundation. So the voice of God is echoing out over the whole earth for all men to respond to his invitation to do his plan. In other words, not just Christians. He's not willing that any should perish, right? That none should be lost. That means God's plan is every human being gets saved. Every Hindu, every Muslim, every Buddhist, every person, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, that they know Jesus Christ as Savior and that they be washed in the blood. That's his strategy. That's his plan. For us to think that, well, God has, he has some plan to be saved and some not, that I cannot see that. I cannot reconcile the scriptures to that theory. He wants everybody saved. Most choose to do their own will instead of his will. But if we cooperate with that, okay, we're coming up to the end. Where it says that few were chosen, it means that, that few people will respond. Matthew 7, 13, 14. And he entered the straight gate. We just studied the scripture. There's a broad entrance and there's a narrow entrance. God made us with a free will to choose. Will you obey the call to perform or conform to his plan is the question. If you obey, he brings you through a further process of refinement to be able to accomplish that will. And now let's go down to this, because remember, it's not our own strength. He starts with justification. We go look at the number four. We saw foreknowledge. We saw predestination. And we saw calling. He's called you to that plan. But now it's not possible for you to do that plan, even though he's called you to do it, unless you first be justified. That is saved. Justified means made right. God justifies you. And whom he called, them he also justified. If you respond to the call of God, which is first come and get saved, he will save you. And when you respond to the call of the Lord on your life and believe in him, he makes you righteous by saying that you are. And just because he said so, you are. Well, I still have sin in my life. I don't care what you have. He said you're righteous. Yeah, but I still have all these problems. I don't care. You can tell me anything you want. He told me you're righteous. I'm going to take his word for it. And from your perspective, you can decide that his word is not true then. Because I have sin in my life. It is true. You understand what justification means? Did you ever justify somebody? That they're horrible people with a bad personality and the friend of yours complains about that other friend and says this guy's horrible. You justify him. No, but you don't understand. He's been through a lot. You start justifying why they're like that. You're justifying. That's what God's doing for you. But I have sins in my life. God knows exactly what you have in your life, but he loves you so much and he's so eager to make you a part of his plan that he makes it all go away. His love covers a multitude of sin. This is good news. What does it say in the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him. For God. That's all you need to do is believe. Hebrews 6, um, verse 6 of chapter 11. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder. What does he reward us with? With his justification. This step leads you to the next where God finally uses you to accomplish his plan. And what is that? Glorification. And this is our last one. Glorification. Now this word can be a little elusive. Glorification sounds religious, doesn't it? Glorification. <laughs> well, we know glory. We know the Hebrew word for glory means weight, which is the presence of God, the glory of God. The glory of the Lord filled the temple, synonymous with presence. The aura around God is His glory. The Shekinah. In heaven... His glory is the light of the city. There's no need for lamp. There's no need for moon. There's no need for anything but Him. He is the light of the city. His glory luminesces everything. It shines through everything. So when He glorifies you, that means He takes that glory and He puts it all over you and makes you sticky with it. He smears you with the anointing. The very word anointing means smeared. Anoint like an ointment, rub it on you so you look greasy with Jesus. He anoints you. That's glorification. And whom he justified, then he also has glorified. I'm going to cover you with glory. I'm going to put it all over you. 
justified, I say you're righteous. So guess what? You're righteous. And now, on top of that, so that you can do everything written in my book, I'm going to glorify you. <laughs> when does he do that? When we go to him. When we go to him, what do you think is happening in the services when we're worshiping the Lord? And suddenly this funny feeling comes over us and we're shaking and we end up like, like Lidana on the floor down there. Esther in the power of God and she's glorified. You want to see glorified love? See, 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 there it is. <laughs> That's glorified. Glory all over it incapacitating her like that. Oh, she's just crazy. No, all of us have been on that floor just like that. In our time, when God chooses moments, because it's not always he's doing it, he chooses moments and says, I'm going to glorify you right now. <laughs> oh, God. He had a desire according to that purpose that caused him uh, to make a plan and invite you to walk it out. He has his purpose and his plan. And though this process, through it all, we see that God has a purpose for you and He's going to anoint you to be able to do it. He said, yes, to, if you say yes to the Lord, you believed in Him and His purpose for you, submitting to that plan, He justifies you, and now He's lifting you up and using you, not in your own strength, because we already know He has no use for that at all, but He's given you the Holy Spirit to stand at your side and anoint you or glorify you. And empower you with power that goes beyond you. What a wonderful thing he's done. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. He glorifies you here on earth and will glorify you in heaven with him throughout eternity if you obey his plan. You understand? What he's doing, the glorification of earth is, is infinitesimal compared to the glorification we're going to have. That's what creation is waiting for. It can't wait for the manifestation of the sons of God when they walk in the complete glory. When we no longer see in part or look through a glass darkly, but we see face to face, we see him as he is in all of his splendor and light. That light and splendor is going to glorify us. That's why we need new bodies, because if we were to see it right now, we would turn into a pile of instant ashes and the wind would blow us away. This earth suit could never withstand the light of God in its full intensity. But he's giving us an incorruptible, indestructible body to be able to withstand the intensity of the light of his glory. And when he's given it to us, he's going to set us up like puppets in front of the throne. And he's going to say, ta-da! And boom, the light of God is going to hit us like a tsunami and we're going to find it amazing that we are able to stand our ground. <laughs> For centuries it's going to just run over us to the point that we're going to glow like some kid's glow-in-the-dark toy. We're going to be shining with the light of God. Glorified. I believe this stuff. This isn't just a theatrical presentation to me. This is a reality to me. This is my destiny. This is where I'm going. I'm on my way to the throne room of God where I will luminesce with the glory of God and I will live forever and eternity in that heavenly place and I get to live it in principle right here on earth according to what he wrote in my book and your book. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in Now we go back to this very important contingency. Resting upon the fulcrum of his will versus your will is the heir that you are receiving the inheritance that we started out talking about to get where we are right now. You want that glory? You want to be glorified in heaven like that forever, for eternity? Do His will. Please, I'm begging you tonight with everything in my heart. Please do God's will for your life. If you have not done so yet, take your spiritual library card and check out the book. Take it home and study it through prayer, through fasting. Say, God, what is your exact purpose for my life? Tell me the details. Show me. He will open the book for you. He will show you. 
Not everything, because as I said, you can't handle it. And just because some people call him Lord, it does not mean you do his will. We talked about that recently too, the Lordship principle. We must cooperate with his purpose. We must consecrate our lives for his plan. Matthew 6, 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to stop right there. I want you to stand on your feet with me. As you do, just close your eyes in the presence of the Lord. We're going to pray. chapter, Romans chapter 8. And we, Lord, we're groaning inside. We want to be like you. We want to do the things that you do. But we often find it difficult. We fail. We make mistakes. But the good news is that you are our justifier. We didn't go into the scripture that follows this, but it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who is he that condemns the righteous, it says? Who could possibly come to you in light of this evidence? This is what we're, we're kind of skipping over right now. Could come to you in light of this evidence and say, no, I'm going to condemn you because of your sin. And the scripture says nobody because it is Jesus who justifies. And who's going to argue with Jesus? That's why it says nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Not death, not life, not height, not depth. The writer, Paul, he goes on and on talking about there's nothing. There's no famine. There's no sword. There's no disease and no sickness. Nothing can separate you because God is so much more powerful than even your stupidity. God is stronger than your sin. If you simply trust Him, if you trust Him, so you make mistakes, so you sometimes stumble and fall, it's irrelevant in light of His purposes for your life. He will lift you up and say, after He brushes the dust off of you, say that nothing happened, there was never a fall. Look the other way. And whoever comes and tries to say, oh yeah, well I saw them fall, He's going to say, oh yeah, you arguing with me? You understand that the most powerful thing there is, is on our side. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The accuser of the brethren comes, Satan comes to try to tell you of your faults, and you're listening to him a lot of times, and say, yeah, I know, I know, but who is he that condemns? It is Jesus Christ that justifies he foreknew you. He predestined you. He wrote that book and he's called you to it. He says, come and see the good idea I have for you. Come and see the wonders I have strategized and planned in the heavenly blueprints that I've written down for you to live. Come. Come and see them. And you say, there's no way I'll be able to fulfill these things. And he takes you to justification. He says, oh, don't worry about your sin. Don't worry about your inability. I justify you. Because I said so, you were perfect. Because I said so, you were cleansed. And after that, if that's not enough, he glorifies you by pouring the Spirit of God upon you, pouring the anointing over you like so much oil, pouring down on Aaron's head on the day of his anointing. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, and it gives you supernatural power. <laughs> the anointing of the Holy Spirit in this world. God's power is here. Not our power. We don't have power. We have nothing, but He has everything. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I feel the fountain. I feel the flow of the Spirit. There's glory up here flowing right now. It's very simple. We're going to do the altar call this way. If you want to come and receive God's glory, just come to the front here and just pray with me. Just come. You don't have to come if you don't want to. 
if you just want as an act of faith to come forward and say, Lord, I want you to glorify me tonight. I don't want you to anoint me, rub heaven's oil over me. I'm telling you, his power is here right now. Just come hungry. Just come hungry to receive and open yourself to him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. We welcome your power.